Good afternoon. I am Noah's mom. Um, I'm Elisa Holton now. I feel bad I didn't bring a, a picture of Noah in my I have two boys, Noah and Sam. Noah is four and a half and Sam is two. Uh, Noah was diagnosed in 2014 at six months of age with acute flaccid myelitis. He was a normal, healthy pregnancy. He was reaching all his milestones, and he had a cold throughout the month of September in 2014, and I was watching the news, and I saw that the enterovirus was, you know, all over the news at the time, and so I brought him to the pediatricians a lot, and they said, well, he's not wheezing, so we're not concerned, because primarily back in 2014, they were saying, watch out for for children who are wheezing. And so I thought, okay, he's okay. And uh, on October 3rd, he woke up and I put him on my bed and he fell backwards. And I put him, I thought, well, he's just probably still sleepy. So I sat him up again and he fell backwards. And then I looked at his legs and they were butterflied. And I pinched his little toes and nothing moved. And I pinched really hard and nothing moved. Um, we called our pediatrician who told us to go to the ER and we rushed over there. Uh, we were there for about 15 minutes and I'm grateful that awareness is getting out because if that hospital would have kept him to try to figure it out themselves with the, well, I can figure this medical mystery, my son would not be where he is today. Um, there, we got there, I remember the doctor coming up to me saying, I'm so sorry, I don't know what's wrong, and I wish, I need to contact her and say, thank you for just not wasting our time and running tons of tests there, because she immediately had an ambulance and took us to Boston Children's. Uh, my husband and I, Mitch, raise your hand, Mitch, <laughs> we live about 45 minutes north from here. We were rushed to Boston Children's, we spent the day in the ER, uh, GBS, Gillian Beret <coughs> syndrome was what? they initially thought and then they thought some type of myelitis. Um, I think it was quick acting of the ER because it was in the news and the more we do spread awareness across the country, I think um, physicians aren't gonna rule it out as much. I think it's gonna be more in the back of their head. Is this gonna be the one in the million? Uh, especially now where it feels like, um, uh, Dr. Jenna Ely will touch on this, where in PT school she said to me, that they may not see a AFM or TM case, and now she knows two people. So awareness is key, and I think you know all of us here today getting educated and spreading awareness that's gonna really benefit our community. Um, Noah was admitted to Boston Children's Hospital as we were in the ER that day. The paralysis did spread up his body. His upper arms got weak. His head started to, to go to the side. His face started to droop. They did a a feeding tube, uh, we had an MRI, spinal tap, um, later was diagnosed with acute flaccid myelitis. Uh, Dr. Gorman jumped, jumped on our team and, and saw Noah um, and started following our case. And um, they, you know, we didn't know where Noah would go and at that time being six months old, the benefit of him was to go home uh, and do therapy from there because he was so little. So we started with uh, early intervention, came to my house, and they said, well, we can, uh, we can do therapy at home, and so I, we did that instead of going to outpatient therapy, um, just with having a six-month-old at the time, um, with naps and everything, we just felt it was best to do it in our house. Um, from there, our physical therapist, Jenna Ely, uh, noticed the progress faster than I did because I was with Noah every day and I think that's a, an important thing as a mom. I was with him every day so I was just looking at Jenna and said, I, he's not making progress. And she's like, yes he is. You know, she, she could see it faster than I could because I was with Noah every day. So she saw, you know, the little twitch or the little movement before I could see it. Um, I do know when, I when we left the hospital, Noah did regain movement in his upper body and did get the feeding tube out. Um, he was paralyzed from the waist down. So having a physical therapist that saw the prognosis before I did was key. Um, she immediately helped me advocate and jump on board. Noah started doing seven sessions of physical therapy in a five-day period at just seven months old. Uh, we did horseback hippotherapy, um, aqua therapy, music therapy, um, and then the rest were your PT sessions, which for that age looks more like play, you know, it's play, but it's physical therapy. 
Um, I do credit Jenna Ealing to my son or to getting him where he was. She's very humble and she won't say that, but it's very true. Um, and then from there, uh, when he turned three, he got discharged from early intervention and we now attend Project Walk Ability Center in Stratum, New Hampshire. Um, if you haven't checked it out, check it out. They do have what's called a geo machine. It's from Rayo Technology. They do have one at KKI, but the closest one in New England is at Project Walk, and that's where Noah is uh, going. He walks with a walker on long journeys. We go on to um, use a wheelchair. He's got a mobile stander, and I commend these physicians for dedicating their careers to finding out more about AFMTM and the other rare neuroimmune disorders because Without them, we wouldn't have the answers that we have today, and we're only getting closer to finding more answers, so thank you. Um, I am also the organizer of the Massachusetts Walk, Run, and Roll, so I see some of you have your t-shirts on, so that's very exciting, thank you. Um, if you haven't been to one of a, a Walk, Run, and Roll event, I encourage you to go. It's, like I said, it's about building a community where my husband and I said, you know, we're not gonna let if I um, define our family. We are gonna make it into a positive. I became a mom on the mission. I couldn't just sit back and let AFM dictate my family. Um, so we raised money and uh, over the past three years we've raised over $50,000 for research for TMA. So we're really excited about that. So we're gonna talk about chronic pain symptom management, and first I'm gonna welcome Dr. Greenberg back up here um, to share with us a broad overview of the symptoms to be aware of when one is diagnosed with a rare immune disorder. Dr. Greenberg. So I have no slides. Uh, there are gonna be no diagrams of spinal cords or cells or anything like that, um, and my part's gonna be very short. We're about to hear a a series of talks on different symptoms, and I just wanted to set the stage in terms of a framework to be thinking about all of these different things. Uh, first off, as you're sitting here, either yourself or your loved one may or may not have some of the symptoms we talk about. Uh, as Dr. Benson stressed and I reiterated, depending on what part of a nervous system is affected, the optic nerve, the brain, the brain stem, the spinal cord, and within the spinal cord, which part of the spinal cord is affected, you will have one or more symptoms that are described. So, if something that is being discussed, you sit back and you say, well, I don't have that. It just means those fibers weren't affected in you. Uh, and that's great that you don't have all the symptoms. The other thing to recognize, and this is where having a big tent organization is important, is whether you've had transverse myelitis or acute disseminated encephalomyelitis or neuromyelitis optica, there are a lot of overlapping symptoms. And so we have patients who have NMO and patients who have AFM and TM who have very similar symptoms, and the approach to management, regardless of the mechanism of injury, is often quite similar. And so this is one of those talks where we really come together as a community because it doesn't matter what title you wear, what diagnosis label you have, uh, the way we approach a lot of these symptoms are gonna be quite similar. And so as you're going through this, you can personalize what applies and zone out or listen with interest for those things that don't. And as we move from the talks to the question and answer uh, session that uh, um, is gonna be moderated, um, uh, I will remind everyone of one other thing. As we're bringing up your specific uh, events for the healthcare professionals here, we will do our best to answer in generalities. We cannot give specific advice about, oh, you should take 50 milligrams of aspirin. Uh, we can't do that for, for a lot of reasons, so we, we talk about the generalities of things. And what we stress as you're listening to these talks is you need to have a good working relationship with a healthcare provider to work through these. Notice I didn't say a physician. So sometimes it's a physician, sometimes the person in charge is a nurse, nurse practitioner, physician assistant, physical therapist. Um, there are lots of individuals who can be of incredible benefit. The key is your relationship with them. And as you're thinking about the symptoms you have and the symptoms you wanna address, you wanna keep them organized in your head and organized in front of you, because as you engage your healthcare providers, which is sometimes a great experience and sometimes a really frustrating experience, you want to go into those visits setting them up for success. That sounds strange. We're here to serve you. Why should you be setting us up for success? Because these days you only get so much time in the room after the door closes. 
And that's just a reality of the situation we're in. And so you want to make really good use of that time. So as you listen to the symptoms and you think about yourself or your loved one, you need to think about how do they relate to each other and what would your individual priorities be so that when you go to your next visit and you say, hey, I was at the symposium and they talked about X, you know that you're rank ordering what the most important things are to you and trying to get success at each of those visits at chipping away at the different symptoms that occur. So with that in mind, I will turn things over uh, to our first presenter. I think uh, Elisa's going to do the introduction. All right, good luck, everybody. It's going to be fun. I just want to also add, we fly out to Texas once a year to see Dr. Greenberg, too. He's part of our team. It takes a village, people, so as you know. So we've got a big village, and we've got a good one. Um, thank you, Dr. Greenberg. Dr. Christine Sang um, will come up. He uh, will, can speak from there. Um, Dr. Sang, would you mind being able to tell us what central neuropathic pain is, what causes it, and what are the mechanisms? Yes. Would you like for me to give a talk on this? Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So um, I'll just explain that I am, I'm an anesthesiologist, pediatric and adult anesthesiologist and pain specialist, and I direct the Translational Pain Research Program at the Brigham, uh, and uh, we started 21 years ago at Mass General, and about 15 years ago just shifted over to the Brigham. Let me just say first that I have some disclosures to make. The first is that I served many years on the board of the National Spinal Cord Injury Association, which at the time represented um, all the, civil the civilian population in the US affected by spinal cord injuries and diseases, and they were then acquired by the United Spinal Association. Both, uh, actually, it, they still call themselves, we still call ourselves, I'll explain in a second, the, the National Spinal Cord Injury Association slash United Spinal Association, we have a resource center that is a great resource. If you would like to go and look it up, just Google United Spinal Association. There are a lot of links, a lot of, um, there's, there, there's a 24-7 uh, manager and nurse manning the phones and email, and so feel free to ask questions and uh, they can send you to specific links and resources. So about um, 13 or 14 years ago, when I was on the board of the National Spinal Cord Injury Association, I founded the Medical and Scientific Advisory Committee because we needed a large committee of experts covering a variety of different fields that are important to those who have spinal cord injuries and diseases ranging from not just pain, um, but cardiovascular problems, um, uh, urologic problems, uh, issues, uh, GI problems, autonomic problems. Um, we have physical therapists and occupational therapists and people involved in the discovery of different assistive devices and other innovations and stem cell therapies and so on. This is an area that was going to be important to the community, and so we actually still continue to um, serve this community. I also am a director of the Rick Hansen Institute, which is, a, uh, which is focused on spinal cord injuries and diseases specifically in uh, Canada, and I have spent a lot of time working on a variety of different treatments, pharmacological treatments of central neuropathic pain following spinal cord injuries and diseases, but the most important disclosure that I have to make is that my father, one month after my first grant in spinal cord injury, in 1997, my father sustained a spinal cord injury and moved to Boston for his care. And as a caretaker and a family member, 
I finally got it. I finally got what we clinicians uh, oftentimes forget. And that is what's really important to individuals and their caretakers, but really important to the individuals in terms of what the goals are and what important, what the functions are. It made me realize for the first time that we oftentimes miss the mark. We think that we have specific outcomes that are important to our patients and we, every second, all we care about is improving the lives of our patients. But the patient is the most important member of that team. And off, if one isn't exposed to it, isn't living it, either as the patient or the caretaker, oftentimes it's just hard to get. And so communication can be difficult. E expressing what's important to you as an individual can be difficult to your clinician or physician, but it really is extremely important. For example, the need to have enough tone to stand, to potentially take care of this, uh, take advantage of some of the new technologies, to take advantage of some of the assistive technologies, for example. One needs the tone that we take away using the majority of the analgesics that we do use to treat um, central neuropathic pain following spinal cord lesions. That's just one of many examples, and I'll, I'll try my best to touch on them. The other it, it disclosure is that my brother sustained a severe ischemic stroke uh, now 11 years ago with a dense paralysis on his dominant side, and I can see that recovery can go well beyond what we're oftentimes told. In fact, after all these years, I still think, and he certainly feels, that recovery continues. And I think that's really important to understand. Oftentimes, it needs support. We, you know, obviously, um, not everyone lives near centers that can provide the kind of support, the kind of treatments like physical therapy, occupational therapy, that is needed to keep things going but I have seen with my eyes, not just in my patients, but in my own brother, that actually recovery can continue. So please remember that. Okay, so now I'll finally, finally start my talk about central neuropathic pain because probably a good proportion of you have felt one or more of these symptoms. Burning pain, which is common aching, throbbing, or cramping pain, tingling, the pins and needles, or electric pain, cold pain, pain that feels like burning, shooting or stabbing pain, swelling, tightness, constricting pain, or pain, you know, around your thorax, that's wrapping around your thorax so it can feel difficult to breathe. Pain that's brought on by just lightly touching the skin like a sunburn. These can exist singly or in combination. And certainly not everyone develops central neuropathic pain following a lesion to the spinal cord, but following traumatic spinal cord injury, it's about a half to two thirds uh, based on a fairly large body of data now following multiple sclerosis, it's closer to about 25%. Um, and so there certainly is a proportion, I would say probably at least a handful of individuals in this room have felt, for example, burning pain associated with the myelitis. Is, am I correct about that? Okay. So they're different, we can categorize them differently, okay? But I want to say this, that there are two very common distributions of pain following, pain associated with a spinal cord lesion. The first is a band-like distribution of pain at the level that's affected, okay? That can feel burning, constricting, sunburn-like, electrical, shock-like, any of the above descriptions that I just mentioned. In addition, there's a second common distribution of central neuropathic pain. Has anyone felt like they've been lifted by the neck and dipped into a pot of burning hot pain? That is something that we hear also Commonly. That can also be associated with 
that touch of a pain that I mentioned. Okay. This is one of those distributions. I don't know if anyone feels in this room has ever felt like there was a sunburn-like pain in a band-like distribution. Yeah. After traumatic spinal cord injury, there may be additional contributors to this, but what we do know is that even in animal models of central neuropathic pain with a clean lesion of the spinal cord, we see exactly what we see in humans, in patients. This is just one of a handful of animal models of spinal cord injury, and I would guess that some of you at least have experienced that kind of pain that my patient I showed you a few slides ago experiences. So there are multiple mechanisms that account for the onset and the maintenance of central neuropathic pain. When we say central, we're referring to where the lesion is located and the spinal cord is part of the central nervous system. So central neuropathic, but also particularly uh, where, we, I mean, really, in everyone with SCID, we also see that the inputs, for example, musculoskeletal pain associated with use, overuse of the upper extremities, those inputs in anyone can feel painful oftentimes. Strain here and uh, perhaps carpal tunnel. But where we already have problems with processing painful signals because there's a heightened response associated with a spinal cord lesion, even regular overuse pain syndromes can feel terrible. And I am sure that there are more than a handful of individuals in this room who have overuse pain syndromes that feels really, can feel difficult to treat. So let's first talk about the central neuropathic pain, okay? And there are a lot of mechanisms that have been identified over the last about 30 or 40 years associated with, excuse me, with a spinal cord uh, lesion, really of any sort, of a variety, a variety of lesions similar to uh, the rodent model that I just showed you. But what's important here is not the specific mechanisms per se. What I'd like to impart to you is that if you take one of these rodents, okay, and you stimulate, let's, let's say, the hind limb. So if you can assume that the rodent, this little mouse or rat, after a spinal cord injury lesion, okay, is paralyzed from the waist down, after a lesion of the thoracic uh, spinal cord. And you stimulate the legs. It's painful, and that we get, right? We understand that, because that is oftentimes what we're feeling ourselves. After a hemisection of the cord, so a lesion just of one part of the cord, in fact, this particular animal feels that pain on both sides. Isn't that interesting? And Furthermore, above the level of the injury, above the level of the lesion, on the same side as the lesion, uh, I'm sorry, on the same side as the abnormal finding of the hind paw, that hyper excitable, that extremely painful sensation, which is perhaps just evoked by lightly touching the hind paw even in the forelimb on that side, it's painful. This is, these, are, these are graphs from these behavioral assays in animal models, but I just wanted to show you that even above the level of injury, it's painful. Furthermore, it's painful on both sides. So in fact, this is a rodent model of central neuropathic pain with a clean lesion on just one side of the spinal cord and all four limbs are processing inputs as being exceptionally painful. Why could that be? It's very likely, 
actually, we have lots of animal data to suggest that there are changes not just at the spinal cord level, but the changes, there are changes that occur above the spinal cord in the brain. There are parts of the brain that are responsible for pain processing, and those parts of the brain can also become hyperexcitable, sensitized. So we're not interpreting, so now we're interpreting these painful inputs as being exceptionally painful. Um, now, overuse pain syndromes, I already mentioned that, and that is one, what I just said was, is one of the bases for my comment earlier that even overuse pain syndromes can feel really exceptionally painful. So one more thing. We classify conditions based on diagnosis, but we have to remember that having a diagnosis of TM, for example, it doesn't necessarily offer a great framework for the clinical management of the pain. We have to explain our symptoms in detail, okay? More than one mechanism may be operating in a single patient. In fact, probably innumerable mechanisms. We, we just talked about spinal cord mechanisms, and there are also these supraspinal mechanisms. One individual mechanism might be responsible for many symptoms. That is certainly the case, and that's been shown in animal models. And the same symptoms in any two patients might be caused by completely different mechanisms. That is true as well. So what we know by seeing our doctor and trying different meds is that trial and error is important, but um, trial and error is important in, we have to make sure that it's important in the context in which we're functioning. Um, so this is a very basic approach to treatment. Make the diagnosis, but it has to be based on a careful assessment, a careful explanation of our symptoms and the timeline, what makes it better, what makes it worse, does even touching the skin cause pain? Those are all really important to try to sit back and think about. Remove potential exacerbating factors. In fact, my next slide will summarize this in, in part. It's, it's really important to make sure that infections are controlled and um, that things that make pain heightened are controlled, okay? And then we uh, can start to think about imp uh, what medications, our doctors will think about what medications are most appropriate, and we have to uh, very clearly try to define what it means to us to improve our overall quality of life. When I say potential exacerbating factors, these are controlling UTIs, uh, trying to identify early, it can be difficult, the development of decubitus ulcers, and trying to address issues of bowel and bladder distension, all of which can make pain worse. I just want to mention really quickly that gabapentin and Lyrica are drugs that you may have tried. These are also medications that require high doses. And at high doses, what's different in spinal cord injuries and diseases generally, including in TM, is that these take away tone. So in fact, gabapentin and Lyrica, Lyrica is the only drug that is FDA approved for central neuropathic pain, can in fact make our legs feel flat, basically take away tone, take away the ability to stand, and as I mentioned earlier, potentially use some of these you know, innovations that do require a certain amount of function. Um, and I mentioned this class of drugs, which is like ketamine, which you might have heard of before. In fact, most of these drugs also, most of the analgesics that are clinically available do take away tone, central spasticity. And we need to make sure we can figure out what degree of tone is still needed to use some of the innovations that are coming out. Um, one of them, dextromethorphan, is the only one. It's the only one in this class that spares uh, 
this motor dysfunction, but hopefully we can find others. I just want to say one word about other issues. When, we choo when your doctor chooses medications, they will need to be in the context of other problems that we may have that are associated with spinal cord lesions. So I already mentioned gabapentin and pregabalin, but for example, amitriptyline can actually m make bowel and bladder dysfunction worse. It can cause dry mouth and other problems. It can actually also affect our, um, your, um, some cardiac issues. Okay, so I touched on all these. This is my summary slide. The most important is that you have to identify goals, what, and, and, you know, get out there and try to identify as many of these potential new therapies and clinical trials as you can. Figure out uh, what, please feel free to take a picture of this, um, figure out what's important to you. If standing and potentially ambulating or ambulating with assistive devices is really important, it's important. We have to make sure our doctors know this. Okay. Okay. So thank you so much for your attention, and please feel free to contact me or our group at any time. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Sang. Continuing the discussion on pain management, we are joined by Dr. Christine Seberg, who is the Director of Biobehavioral Pediatric Pain Lab, Department of Psych Psychiatry, Department of Anesthesiology, Critical Care and Pain Management at Boston Children's Hospital. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I'm just going to, there are slides in your book. I'm not sure if they correspond to exactly the order. I'm going to just talk about a few things, but um, you have the slides for reference, and you can always feel free to email me if you have questions, or maybe it'll come up in the panel discussion. Um, so I'm actually a clinical psychologist specializing in pediatric chronic pain, but actually my interests are in children as well as especially the adolescent young adult transition. Um, and from a lot of the talk we just heard, uh, it is important to consider non-pharmacological treatment for pain. And this essentialized neuro neuropathic pain that was just discussed is important, and we see it across disease conditions. So there may be symptom overlap, like we heard, within, within myelitis, but also the, the strategies I'll talk about today work across people who have long-term pain from surgeries, from migraines, from other neuropathies. So um, I work with a variety of types of patients, um, and these symptoms are really steeped in a lot of, uh, sorry, these interventions are steeped in a lot of evidence. So what's important to know is that chronic pain is different from acute pain. Acute pain is a signal in the body that something is wrong, where chronic pain is um, non-protective pain. It's like a false alarm in your body. And it often makes you or makes patients think to treat acutely. So they'll say, oh, I might have to avoid my activities or what I value, which is what was touched upon at the last slide there, um, because I'm in too much pain. So what's really going to be important with your physicians and healthcare providers is differentiating acute versus chronic pain. And chronic pain is actually treated very differently than acute pain. Um, chronic pain is like a bad habit in the nervous system. The, nerv the nerves get stuck and continue to send pain signals, sometimes for no reason. Um, and this can lead to central sensitization where pain predicts pain and you, you end up winding up your nervous system and developing more pain. So as a psychologist, I do see a lot of patients who have stress, and I think a lot of patients are hesitant to, to see me because they say, well, it's because I'm crazy or people think the pain is in my head. And that's, well, that is true because all pain is in your head. It's, it's a process from your brain. Um, but that's, we know that having stress and having an illness and have experiencing chronic pain can increase um, stress, and there's a bi-directional relationship between the two. And when we're under stress, your body goes into this fight or flight um, mode, and that Automat, um, automatic physiological response 
It will create muscle tension, changes in your breathing and your heart rate, um, digestion gets interrupted, and stress hormones are released, and that just is going to exacerbate or make your pain worse. So psychologists treat pain because we do want non-pharmacological strategies for some of the reasons we just heard. We also have one nervous system. We have um, the same nerves that communicate about pain, also communicate about stress and emotions and behaviors and your reactions. How you think, feel, behave, respond, and interact affects how much pain you feel. Uh, and we know that chronic pain as a result can affect other areas of your life. Um, inability to attend school or work, um, family stress, um, living a values-based life. And then we get, can get into the cycle of pain and disability where we feel like we can't break it. Um, so what can we do about the pain? So there's good cognitive behavioral strategies. Cognitive is your thoughts. Behaviors is what you're doing, your actions. Um, and, and so I, if you need referrals, um, to a, if you think you'd like to see a pain specialist, specialist who specializes in CBT, um, abct.org is a great resource to find a provider near you. Um, you can learn behavioral coping skills such as relaxation strategies, distraction. Your brain can only focus on so much at once. So if you're kind of trying to distract yourself away from the pain, that can be helpful. There's a variety of ways to do that. Belly breathing is a great way just to send that response back to your brain that I'm okay because you start getting worked up and the pain signals start getting stronger. So that can, audit three. I am a big believer in th th three big deep breaths can just start to send the right message back to your brain. Visual imagery can be, um, uh, is also really great. Personal relaxation strategies, such as listening to music, taking a bath, anything you can do to calm your nervous system. Because remember, chronic pain is a nervous system issue. Um, and then progressive muscle relaxation. This isn't indicated for all patients. It really would be depending on, you don't want to exacerbate your pain, but it is a good way to be mindful of where you have tension in your body. Sometimes we just don't, aren't aware of that. So by gradually um, tightening your muscles and releasing them and going through each parts of your, of your body, then you can start to realize this is what tension feels like. This is what relaxed feels like. And you start to cue yourself when you are in that trap. Um, chronic pain we know causes chronic muscle tension, and so that, that's a good um, strategy. Visual imagery, doing relaxing scenario, there's lots of great apps um, that you could do visual imagery. Biofeedback is also really popular. It can be hard to find practitioners, but um, if you can do it, it is great. It's getting information um, from your body. It's like a thermometer, so you may have sensors looking at um, sweat and muscle tension um, and belly breathing and heart rate and that's again giving you immediate input oh I thought I was relaxed oh I'm not as relaxed as I think I I, uh, I was so that could be causing a pain flare right now and you can see how your body then changes when you're stressed versus relaxed um, so your thoughts about pain can really have a big influence on your pain um, so it's not saying if you're having the worst pain flare of your life, you're not going to say, oh, I feel great. I don't have a pain flare. That would be lying to yourself. But try to focus on the positive. And I give some, um, some examples in the slides. We all have that internal ver um, narrative and voice in our head. So tr trying to focus on more positive thoughts. I'm having an awful pain flare, but I managed to get out of bed this morning. I managed to go get my mail um, or do some homework. Um, that can be really powerful. Um, and then living life with pain. We really want to make pain a small piece of your existence and to not give it all the attention that um, it often receives. So engaging in as many healthy activities as possible. And again, working with your provider of what you're, what you're allowed to do um, and what you, what you can do realistically, where you are and where you want to be. And so going to maybe school um, or work, sleep, um, sleeping, eating, friends, family, exercise, um, continuing regular activities to the best of your ability. Um, and that, that really, that healthy lifestyle can help with pain. I'm just going to touch very quickly on sleep because a lot of patients I work with have 
really bad sleep, and we understand why. If you're in pain, it's difficult to fall asleep and stay asleep. So I have some good sleep hygiene tips in the slides, and I would just suggest try to follow as many as you can on a regular basis. Um, and the big thing is really having a regular sleep cycle. And I'll say one thing that I think patients often get confused, they get really discouraged. They may be going to bed at like 10 o'clock at night because they feel that's when I should go to bed, and they fall asleep at 3 in the morning. So just um, if that is you, I often and tell patients start small so go back by a half hour because your sleep cycle is not currently set to 10 p.m. and you're going to be very frustrated so if you're falling asleep at 3 a.m. try going to bed at 2:30 every few nights back it up by a half hour and then work your way to that 10 o'clock or reasonable sleep time um, also never be in bed longer than 30 minutes awake because your body starts to associate the bed with this is where I'm awake this is where I'm in pain this is where I'm stressed if you that is you Try to get out of bed and do a non-stimulating activity, maybe if you like um, essential oils or a lot of my patients like just painting, nothing with electronics, nothing that's going to have too much visual input. Um, that can be really helpful as well, and I have other tips there. And lastly, a lot of what I do is school reintegration. So for those of you that may be in school, I give some tips as well. Um, we want you to attend school. We want patients with pain and diseases to attend school, it's important. Um, but this could also be applicable to a work as well. If you've missed months and months of school, it may not be realistic to say I'm going back a full day, no problem. So you, if you're in a public school, you can, it's, you can work with your school to develop what's called a 504 plan, um, which is accommodations for medical reasons. And it might be a gradual reintegration into school. If you're someone who is currently doing tutoring or home, um, at home, uh, to catch up, I just encourage you to still keep a regular schedule to the best of your ability and to sometimes maybe if tutoring is possible at the library or in the school, that can also be really helpful to give and, and to go to school if it's only for a half hour, an hour, to get that social piece. Um, and then really to just be living a values-based life. And so I often have my patients do a values-based assessment. Everyone's values are different, um, but sometimes pain um, and illness can take us really far away from our values and that can make us not so happy or satisfied with our life and decrease our quality of life. So I just encourage you to think about what you want in life and then how can you um, achieve that. And that is a, those are goals that I often work on with patients as well. So thank you. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. We've had some excellent presentations. Let's give a round of applause to our panelists. Now we're going to focus the rest of this time um, with questions from the audience, which we you put them on those note cards, and I have them here. So we'll go through. Let me just unlock the iPad. All right, so our first question is, any new techniques for managing chronic pain in TM? So, all right, uh, always is the answer. Um, so in, in my experience, when uh, people come to see me with any of these conditions who have had uh, chronic pain, and I inevitably hear at some point during the year, I have tried everything and nothing worked. Uh, often we have to do a little bit of a reset because there really isn't such a thing as trying everything. That's a lot of things to try. And often what we do is uh, integrate several pieces of what you just heard around A, making sure we have the right diagnosis. More often than not, when people come to my clinic with um, uncontrolled pain, first, there's more than one pain syndrome going on. And so there might be neuropathic pain in one part of the body, overuse pain in another part of the body, and orthopedic pain somewhere else. And the approaches to those three things are completely different. And so as people are treated with just the word pain as their label, they fail, 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 uh, but they don't realize they may have helped one part of their pain, but not global pain. So we really start with a fresh assessment of really understanding what we're dealing with and then breaking it down into the bite-sized pieces. Uh, we are a big believer in everything you just heard of that um, pain 
feeds certain life choices that makes the pain worse. And it's not volitional, it's just kind of the cycle people get into, and so we try to take a very holistic approach. I would say, at least in my experience, I'm curious everyone's, when we really partner up and approach things methodically, not just, I tried it for a day, it didn't work, but we really come up with a systematic approach and everyone sticks with it, our batting average is well over 90% for people, getting people's pain not just managed, but significantly managed where it's not impacting their day-to-day -day life. Yeah, I would echo that. So um, I think the peds world does this really well. I don't see always see the model on the adult side. And I think we have to avoid this mind-body dualism doesn't work. Well, I don't think it really works for any illness, but it certainly doesn't work for chronic pain. And so when you come to Boston Children's Hospital, you automatically, if you're coming for a chronic pain assessment, meet with a psychologist and a pain physician and usually a physical therapist. And you come up with the treatment plan together. And then we have different treatment modalities and we even have an intensive day hospital program for really complex chronic pain that's um, eight hours a day of psychology and physical therapy, occupational therapy, catered to each patient's needs and illness. These centers are now popping up. So they are around the country um, and generally do the same thing. Um, there are some adult equivalents. I think we're a little behind in how, I think we're a little more on the pharmalo pharmacological side uh, when it comes to ad treating adult pain. Um, but I would encourage you, especially if you don't live near one of these centers, to, if you're really dealing with chronic pain, to really try to flood your nervous system with these different interventions. And so if you have a pain physician, say, can I have a referral to a psychologist? Even if you don't have, you don't have to have you know, typical anxiety or depression, that's not what we're all about. We're all about restoring functioning and functional restoration, working with your team. I have many, because I talked about non-pharmacological interventions, I have a lot of patients who are also taking gabapentin and, and, and medication, so they're not anti-meds, but it's like, how can we teach you some other skills as well? Um, so maybe you don't always have to have the medication or the highest dose if you don't want it, so. Yes, well, I'm certainly uh, an advocate of non-pharmacological therapies. When it comes to pharmacological therapies, it's really important to remember um, something that I, I only touched on, which is that sometimes medications can really cause uh, adverse effects and one example are the class of opioids, which are very useful, in fact, have been useful for certain types of acute pain, for example, a fracture or some overuse pain syndromes. But sometimes we think, or our physicians think, that um, partial response must mean we need higher doses. And then we get a, maybe a little better response, and then maybe a higher dose. But you have to remember that some of the uh, consequences of this have to do with bowel and bladder, making our bowel and bladder function worse. And so that can actually make pain worse. And then we see doses escalate a little higher and then we're in a vicious cycle. So it's really important to take a step back, keep things, sometimes keep things simple. We see this not only with opioids, but with other classes of drugs where perhaps especially if we're using combination drugs, where perhaps one might be causing some issues, maybe even, even making pain worse sec, you know, downstream. For example, I mentioned amitriptyline, which we don't use as much any longer, but many of the drugs that we do use for pain have one of the mechanisms of action that that particular old drug that we used to prescribe a lot of um, has, and that is an effect on the cardiovascular system. Well, sometimes we also see effects on the bowel and the uh, bladder, and same thing as with opioids. We escalate doses and it's worse, and the pain gets worse, and then we try a different drug and we're in a vicious cycle again. So it's really important for our doctors to, us with our doctors, to together try to think when it comes to pharmacological therapies um, tease out what could be consequences of medications and what are the benefits of medications um, so that they can really help to keep things as simple and clean as possible. And yes, there's a lot of hope. There's always research going on. There are a lot of people out there, a lot of researchers, uh, ourselves included, who will never stop 
just never stop. It is our life's work to keep going until we can really make a difference. Thank you. Our next question is, for those with damage from optic neuritis, is there work or research going on to better protect the optic nerve from nerve damage? Mike, you're up. <laughs> Um, I think this question also applies to spinal cord tissue, brain tissue, and the question really is when you demyelinate a nerve and it's left unprotected, are we developing strategies to protect the nerve so it doesn't die off over time? And the answer is yes, we're looking, there, we're very active in doing that. There are also trials going on, mostly in MS right now, doing the same thing, and these will be directly applicable to you because as Dr. Greenberg mentioned, no matter how the injury occurred, if these new drugs have a benefit that could be useful to you, um, to, the, to the nerve damage after it was done, then it's potentially um, helpful. So um, I would pay attention to the news in, in different arenas. I think also traumatic spinal cord injury and, and several other areas, I should say, where neuroprotection is the key word there that is a, a hot area of research, so I would say yes. Okay, our next question is, what longitudinal studies, if any, are happening to understand the prognosis relative to symptoms presented in acute phase of AFM? We'll both talk. Um, <laughs> So I was just going to say there's a, um, a new effort uh, based out of uh, Hopkins um, trying to engage people across the country of many different stripes. So um, ICU doctors, ID doctors, neurologists, therapists, um, and is it not working? sorry. Um, so lots of interest across the country in a collaboration forming, and one of the goals of that group is to capture the similar data between different centers so that it can then be combined and produce larger da you know, data sets and a better understanding of what's happening with acute cases and the chronic phase of after as we follow up. And there is, it's worth noting, there is an open study uh, that is enrolling right now. It's been enrolling since 2014 called, uh, uh, funny enough, the CAPTURE study. Uh, which is the collaborative assessment of pediatric transverse myelitis, including acute flaccid myelitis. Uh, this was a seven-center um, uh, PCORI-funded study. PCORI is the Patient-Centered uh, Patient Outcomes Research Institute, and they gave a grant before the 2014 outbreak, strangely enough, to do the largest study of longitudinal outcomes in pediatric transverse myelitis, and four months after the study started, the first AFM outbreaks started coming out. And uh, I think Gigi referenced, we had enrolled about 110, 115 children uh, over several years. While the multiple centers where you could go in person to enroll are coming to an end because of the funding, the online cohort still exists. So if anyone is interested in taking part, uh, you just have to contact us at UT Southwestern and there's a over the phone enrollment, you get a link, and uh, we get your records and you can fill out the outcomes over time because we're trying to better understand what happens with different treatments. The same thing I should mention exists for ADEM. It's called the Aperture Study. Uh, so if you or a loved one has had ADEM, you can contact us. Uh, we will be doing remote neuropsych testing for anyone who hasn't had neuropsych testing as part of the data collection. And then the last longitudinal study is called CORE-TM. So when the original capture study launched, it was uh, taking children who were within six months of their event. There are a lot of people who are more than six months out who want to take part in research. So Core TM is open to both adults and children. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter when you. It's for TM, including AFM. Doesn't matter when you had it. The only entry criteria is you have to have access to your MRI from the time of diagnosis. So you have to have had an MRI, be able to get it and supply it in order to have your data. Uh, be part of that study. So for Capture, Aperture, or Core TM, I love naming studies. Uh, um, uh, any of those, we're, we're more than welcome to enroll people. More than happy to enroll people. Core 
Yeah, so the core TM, you contact us. The um, final IRB approval is expected, I think, next week for us to start consenting for it. So it should be any day now that we'll enroll, and it'll be launched on the myelitis.org website. There will be contact information for that one. And, and along those lines, if I can, Lisa, does everybody here know how to monitor for clinical trials in their area or with their conditions? So uh, putting politics aside and whether or not you like government regulation or no government regulation, one of the best laws ever passed years ago was a federal law that says any clinical trial in the United States has to be listed at clinicaltrials.gov. It was to avoid uh, opening up a trial for just a select few patients who knew about it, basically. And so all clinical research, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, you can type in whatever diagnosis you're interested in, your zip code, age, phase of trial, one, two, three, four, and it'll bring up every and any trial that is open or closed uh, in the US, and it has the contact information for any site that is taking part in that trial. So if you say, I wanna know, is there gonna be a neuroprotection trial in optic neuritis, you can literally type optic neuritis, and it'll pull up every optic neuritis trial that's going on. Okay, our next question is regarding bladder and bowel. Are there ways or therapies to manage urgency, frequency issues besides medication? Your turn, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's certainly a, a, a major a symptom that we see chronically uh, after myelitis. Um, we, we work closely with the urologists. Um, we should have a urologist on the, on the panel, maybe some feedback for next time, but um, uh, closely uh, and, and really look to them. Um, they do have, uh, similar to what Christine showed with biofeedback, there are some biofeedback approaches in the, in the urology clinic that are used um, as well. Electrical stimulation. Um. There are a variety of um, methods that are being used currently and clinical trials that are specifically looking at different types of electrical stimulation, specifically for uh, bladder dysfunction. Is it a placement of something, or is it on the criteria? Um, good question. It's a placement. Uh, it, the, the it, involves, yeah, it involves an intervention. Okay. And, uh, I don't know. How what you consider medication also, but uh, bo Botox has also been useful in, for some of my patients. Thank you. Um, is there any specific diet or restrictions that help with symptoms? Uh, yes, I just don't know which one. Uh, <laughs> so so um, I am a firm believer in uh, diet makes it makes a major difference in how people function. I'm also a believer in it's probably not necessarily the food, but the impact on something called the microbiome, the bacteria living in your gut. We've been uh, just launched this past year our first microbiome study around these conditions to try and understand it. Um, but what I tell people is, yes, you are going to be responsive to the food. Uh, I don't think we have an epidemic. This is just my personal opinion of gluten allergies going on, but I think there are some bacteria that love carbs, and if you're eating gluten and carbs, they grow and you don't feel so good. So we encourage our patients to explore nutrition as a integral part of their uh, management. And what we ask is to do it methodically and safely. So if you're gonna be cutting out classes of food, you might wanna talk to a nutritionist to make sure that you're not of missing some sort of essential nutrient that we need to supplement. But do it methodically. This isn't uh, dietary changes for medical management is, aren't for weight loss. So if you're researching your diet for weight loss and you cheat one week, you just don't lose weight. If you're trying to manage your symptoms and change your biology and you cheat one week, you probably just wasted four weeks with that one donut that was calling your name. So um, as you explore diet, if you're gonna do it, do it safely and do it methodically but I, I personally have had patients who say, I either cut out X or added Y and feel a lot better, to which I say, great. And then when patients ask me, which diet should I do? I say, I don't know yet. Uh, Our next question is, is there a link between AFM and TM and hand, foot, and mouth disease? Mark, do you want to come? I mean, 
Um, so <laughs> hand, foot, and mouth disease uh, is, a, is a very common childhood viral illness. Um, you, we, most of us in the room have probably had it at some point um, and or taken care of your child who's, who's had it. Um, and you get uh, kind of uh, ulcerative lesions in the mouth uh, and then lesions on the hands and the feet. Um, it's typically caused by a certain uh, type of virus called the Coxsackie virus, uh, which is similar to, to enteroviruses. Um, we, we have seen, I think, at least one patient who seemed to have AFM uh, following a hand, foot, and mouth uh, viral infection. Um, it's not thought that enterovirus D68 causes hand, foot, and mouth disease, um, as, as far as I know. Um, so it's, prob it's probably a minority of the AFM cases. Do you know where the largest outbreak of hand, foot, and mouth disease is going on right now in the United States? No. Johns Hopkins undergraduate campus, the college campus in, in Baltimore. They've had, I don't know what those undergrads are doing there, but. Uh, Mike, you want to comment on that at no, all? No, I, okay. No, I, I don't hang out down there anymore. Okay. <laughs> Best way to prevent pressure ulcers if you're wheelchair bound. What was that? Uh, best way to prevent pressure ulcers if you're wheelchair bound. <laughs> um, I can give my version. If Janet Dean's in the room, she should uh, speak up as well. Uh, she's being outed in the back. Somebody's pointing. <laughs> so, uh, Janet, do you just want to shout out your best? Uh, Response for this? So I did write uh, an article in one of the AM newsletters on, on skin care um, following um, transverse myelitis or spinal cord injuries. So you could go and look that up too. Um, but mostly it's moving, you know, keeping moving, making sure that you're not sitting in one place for, you know, a long period of time. And you can get skin ulcers in as quick as 15 minutes if you're not moving around. Also protecting your skin. If you have you know, incontinence of bowel and bladder, you need to make sure you keep your skin um, clean and dry. Um, sometimes if you don't have good sensation, wrinkles in clothing, you wanna uh, make sure that you um, uh, keep at bay. You know. um, turning in bed you know, every, every four hours at least, um, using lots of pillows to you know, put between your legs and ankles and any pressure points. Um, Sometimes uh, specialty mattresses for your bed um, is good. Um, diet, you know, making sure you're getting lots of fluid and you know lots of good nutrition to keep your skin healthy. Anything yeah. Else? So, how often, when you mention hydration to a patient, do they say back to you? But then I'm going to the bathroom all the time because of my bladder. <laughs> That's right. So it's always it's always a balance that people have to have to kind of juggle with to try and get you know good good hydration but not have incontinence. So, anything else? Thank you. I, I would encourage you to uh, get online and just uh, go to the unitedspinal.org resource center uh, website, find the email and, and phone number and just give a call because they can answer all these questions. Thank you. In regards to remyelination strategies, what is the timeline? Will it be helpful for patients who are years out from their attack? Stay tuned. That <laughs> lecture is at uh, 3 o'clock, I think. If you have a child that you believe is misdiagnosed and would like the CDC to reconsider their case, are they currently reconsidering older cases? What's the best way to bring attention to your case? I'll give you my two cents. I don't think it matters what the CDC thinks about your case. I think it matters what your treatment team thinks about your case and how you're being treated in terms of a rehab team. I don't think that it specifically affects that, but there may be something else behind the mentality of that question. I would agree. 
I would agree, and I think there's a spectrum that doesn't necessarily all fit the CDC definition, but at the same time, the CDC definition is very broad and catches other things. But anytime you define a disease, it's going to be imperfect, and I think they're trying to capture as much as possible. And again, um, I think there are other ways to raise awareness as well as adding to those numbers via pediatricians and media and um, physicians. Okay, we have time for a few more questions. This next person is asking, I have had TM for two and a half years. Should I get my flu shot? My job requires that I do. Do we want to say it in unison, or <laughs> do you guys want to go one or So I think most of us would encourage people to get the flu shot. I, um, when patients come and they say that they had their attack immediately after the last flu shot, then I sometimes give them pause. And I say, okay, well, Maybe in your case, this would be the one circumstance that I'd say, uh, make sure everyone around you gets vaccinated. But in general, I would say yes, for, especially for transverse myelitis patients who have just that one attack. We don't think your immune system is, is really ab that abnormal. It just made a one-time mistake. And so it should be able to process the flu vaccine appropriately. For people with NMO, we did a study and we found that if you're on treatment and your treatment and your disease is well controlled, then the vaccines would benefit you because they're likely to prevent an infection and infections can trigger relapses. If you're not treated for your NMO, that's not, that's not okay, but we know that if you're not treated, then vaccines can trigger an attack. So a little bit different for TM and NMO. I would just, <coughs> I would just add for kids, you know, there's, there's studies that show that children who have neurological conditions um, have clearly worse outcomes after influenza than you know healthy children so the stakes are even higher if you if you do get the flu um, I think in, in pediatrics uh, kids get a lot more vaccines in general depending on the age than adults so we encounter that question um, but we use kind of the same principles we think about uh, was there any vaccine that was given and it's arbitrary but we typically think about a one month period before the attack um, and that's not necessarily saying that's the definitive cause of, of the uh, attack, um, but we would generally avoid those vaccines in the future. Um, we, w we wait, again, somewhat arbitrary, but at least three months after an attack to give vaccines, um, and then ideally in a period of, of good control. Thank you. Okay. Um, how do I combat the ever-changing neuropathic pain? Medication nerve blockers are not working. Pain clinic is suggest suggesting medical marijuana, but if I use it, I could lose my job. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where I think that, you know, uh, non-pharmacological techniques can be very helpful. And this is also why I think it's good to have them introduced earlier than, you know, because these are never bad skills. No one's ever gonna be like, oh, I shouldn't have practiced that relaxation exercise or done that biofeedback. Like, these are not going to harm you. So, and it takes a while to re-educate your nervous system. So I have patients that will say, well, I practiced belly breathing for three days last week, it did nothing. It's like, these actually have to become part of your lifestyle. They should be part of everyone's lifestyle. We should be teaching these in school because it's not just this condition that needs People, you know, everyone needs to learn stress management and pain management and um, good relaxation it would ha and coping skills. Um, but I think having a healthy lifestyle, first and foremost. So when I see patients, you know, maybe, yeah, they've been out of school for months and months or, you know, but I, we talk, we do the sleep. We do kind of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like where is the diet? I don't know what the best diet is, but maybe it is involving nutrition. Um, maybe, you know, you need to feed your nervous system um, from all directions. So working on the sleep, that will, that's a huge thing right there. Your body cannot function. They've done studies that have, you know, being sleep deprived is the same as having a certain you know, blood alcohol level. Um, so, and then working on how just the coping skills that will be good throughout your life. Um, and that might include, there might be medication too, like we said, I'm not anti-medication, but I do think, um, bringing the nervous system, um, it just kind of attacking it, I call it attacking, that's the wrong word, but flooding it from all different directions um, is really important. Assessing where the stresses are in your life, family dynamic issues, um, you know, wh what's causing you stress at your job, um, how you think about things, um, your, your 
your nervous system can only kind of handle so much stress before it starts coming out. So um, that's important as well, just kind of think about that part of your life and what uh, might be factors that could contribute to the maintenance and exacerbation of pain. Um, I also do, have, I do mouse models too of anxiety and stress and neuropathic pain and I found in a recent one that regardless of who was exposed, mice that were exposed to stress or not from birth, it didn't matter. Being undergoing a, ner a nerve injury was enough to um, create long-term anxiety in the mice, despite, I actually thought, oh, well, the mice that were exposed to stress are gonna do worse, that, that, that was not the case. Um, and so that made me realize, okay, like we often wonder the chicken or the egg, but it's enough, even if you don't have a pre-morbid uh, mental health condition like anxiety or depression prior to your, your illness or your chronic pain, that is enough to, to really may, maybe have anxiety or depression. So treating those symptoms too are going to be equally important. Just a word about medical marijuana. We don't know yet the impact of, um, of marijuana broadly uh, on pain. It seems that there's likely a specific formulation. We're not sure yet what component is the most effective. It looks like, if you look at all the data, because there are a lot of conflicting data, um, maybe one, which is delta-9 THC, might be more useful than the rest. It's just not clear yet, um, but a lot of folks are working on it, so stay tuned. Um, one thing I'd say as well is that pain evolves over time, so that most people who I see who haven't had a really good response to pain medications, um, sometimes they haven't tried adequate doses or adequate duration. Sometimes the provider-patient relationship changes, and. Um, Sometimes we even retry something they thought they, somebody may have tried before, but it's now tried at the right dose and it kind of kicks in because um, the body's constantly changing. And so I think um, just because you've tried something before doesn't mean it's off the table for the rest of your life. It may kind of um, show up as a benefit later on. Thank you. Unfortunately, we are out of time, so the rest of your questions will be answered during the Q&A around 4.30. So let's give a round of applause to our panelists.